Rita Mae Brown. Vito Russo, who was a wonderful man, no longer with us, in his book, uh, The Celluloid Closet, and in his life, made us look back, searching for clues of were we ever in film, were we ever included. His work was so important to all of us. And I didn't think of those things until Vito made me think of those things. And then I realized that, yes, I must have been searching, too. The following lecture by Vito Russo was given on March 11, 1990, at San Francisco's Roxy Theater. going to try to move it along this time because the last time I did this at the Castro Theater, uh, people came in as members of lesbian and gay youth and left as gay senior citizens. <laughs> uh, and I'm sure that most of you know um, that in a few hours it's not possible to cover the entire history of this subject. So uh, what we're going to do is, uh, as usual, we're going to try to do as comprehensive a selective survey t uh, today of how lesbians and gay men are defined on screen from the point of view of someone who really loves the movies. As a rule, uh, I don't believe in judging films based on whether I think it's good for gay people or bad for gay people. It's more complicated than that. Because whether we realize it or not, uh, movies often tell us what we think about ourselves. And there's a contradiction in the way that we, as an audience, approach movies. They're made primarily for fantasy, and yet we look to them to reflect our reality. Uh, they become a sort of wish fulfillment, a representation of a life that doesn't necessarily exist, but one which we've been taught to want. Uh, and so on the one hand, you can always say it's only a movie. But on the other hand, it's a barometer of what we as a people think and believe about the ways in which we live. So today for a little while, we're going to do something that we don't always do. We're going to think about the images which are presented to us and what they're telling us about, our, uh, about ourselves. Uh, much of this program is meant to be fun and is funny. Uh, and I opened with the first sequence both to sort of give you a sense of the history of the subject and also to comically raise the issue of the American idea of masculinity. Uh, just, just to quickly explain a few of the things that were more obscure, uh, the Gay Brothers was the two men dancing a waltz. That was made by Thomas Alva Edison in his New Jersey studio in 1895 as a, an experiment in motion. And he innocently titled it The Gay Brothers. Uh, but you have to remember that in 1895, there were no movies. I mean, there were no movie houses. People looked at this stuff with a crank machine and a Nickelodeon, and there was outrage that he chose to quite innocently use two men dancing a waltz. Uh, and it was, it, was, it was fascinating to me that there would be outrage because almost 100 years ago, what you were getting was the same audience response to two men, two members of the same sex, behaving intimately with one another that you would get today when two men kiss on television. You know, this sort of incredible outrage which has lasted a century. Uh, and it's time they got over it, uh, <laughs> apparently. Uh, um, so the second one that I wanted to just illustrate was Anders Alstiander, and different from the others, was probably the first political gay movie, and it starred Conrad Veidt, who later came to Hollywood and played villain roles, Nazis. He played Major Strasse in Casablanca. This was his first film, and it was a film about a famous violinist being blackmailed for being gay. And 
It was released in 1919, shown all over Germany and in Austria, but when the Nazi youth movements began, they sought out and burned and thought they destroyed all of the prints and all of the negatives to that film. And this was a sort of extraordinary reclamation of gay history because a 45-minute fragment of that film was found in an archive in the Ukraine and with Russian subtitles. Uh, and in fact, it was brought to Amsterdam, <clears throat> excuse me, for a lesbian and gay film festival in the mid 70s and restored and brought to San Francisco where it was seen in this part of the world for the first time in 65 years. And so we're still finding footage all over the place of this sort of thing. But it caused a tremendous sensation in, in Germany in 1919. In fact, in one of his books, Christopher Isherwood recalls that he was in an audience uh, showing of this movie in Vienna when a Nazi youth group came in with pistols and took shots at the audience, wounding several people and burning the film in the street outside, outside the theater. Um, and because we're so close to that kind of activity once again, uh, you know, almost 70 years later, uh, I think it's important for us to remember that this sort of thing continues to happen and that one, one of our chief goals here is to preserve lesbian and gay history so that will never happen again and so that a next generation will have these things to look at and to know their history. Um, and finally, uh, Pandora's Box, which was the Louise Brooks film, was probably the first representation on film of a fully realized lesbian character. A Belgian actress named Alice Roberts played the lesbian character who was in love with Louise Brooks in that film. That came out in 1928. And I want to give you some sort of a sense that even before the United States started doing sort of quasi-gay characters, that you, you did have fully realized representations of lesbian and gay, lesbians and gay men in European films long before America began to deal with this issue in, in any kind of a serious way, or even in a comedic way. Um, so I want to raise the issue, uh, I mean, a lot, of the, a lot of the clips that you saw there that are funny had to do with cross-dressing, had to do with a, a joke based on a uh, gender uh, confusion, it had to do with uh, switching identities, um, and, and why I wanted to raise that in that context is because that often when you see, for instance, drag in the movies, uh, there's a statement being made because the men who are in drag are traditionally masculine men in some sort of patriarchal role of authority. They're either soldiers or cowboys. And the reason why the joke works, or at least ha why it has worked, is because putting a man in a dress and taking him out of the traditional male role as society sees it becomes funny. And so I want to talk a lot today about the definition of femininity and the definition of masculinity and what it means to us and why jokes arise out of that. I mean, the fundamental reasons why we laugh at certain things that have to do with gender. I remember uh, reading A Soul on Ice by Eldridge Cleaver, and there's a letter in there from a woman named Bel Beverly Axelrod, and she says, our tragedy in, in America is not found in our fantasy of what homosexuals are. Our tragedy in America is found in our fantasy of what America is. We have made each other up in this country. We have created each other as images out of nothing. And I think that that's what the movies served to do. They created an America which never really existed, but one which we were taught to want to live in. And, and I think that if you look at the, for instance, the European films, like different from the others, I mean, there were many, many others. Mikael was a film which we've shown at the Lesbian and Gay Film Festival here, uh, which was in 1924, a love story between two men. Uh, Auguste Rodin, the French sculptor, and his protege, played by 19-year-old Walter Slezak, uh, which came to America in 1925 and played only 42nd Street grindhouses on Times Square because it was perceived as pornography because of its subject matter. And they retitled it for the American release, and they called it Change, the Story of a Strange Love. And they had a psychiatrist at every showing to explain homosexuality to the audience. Uh, but of course, there were others. Made Chin in Uniform, uh, a, a superb film by Leontine Sagan, which had a lot of censorship problems and opened in the United States in 1932. Uh, but on the other hand, Hollywood had a completely different 
attitude towards the sexes, towards the relationships between men and women. And I think that that was because for the first movies spoke to our pioneer heritage, this illusion that we had of ourselves as a virile, masculine society, the conquering of the wilderness. Um, the Westerns were the first popular movies. Uh, there was an anti-intellectualism about early Hollywood movies, the sort of Eastern sissy versus the Western cowboy. The conquering of the wilderness meant that this was the leading country, that we called the shots, that we were the most powerful country in the world. And movies reflected that. And what you got was a, a portrait of America where there was no room for weakness or effeminacy. And if you look, for instance, uh, at Crocodile Dundee or Rambo or any of those films, uh, you see that they are the direct descendants of the Westerns because we don't make Westerns anymore in, in our society. And so those films sort of fill that void of having the masculine, aggressive hero and what you find in those films is not so much homosexuality, because I've looked, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you do find, uh, as, a, as a thread which runs through these films, a fear of homosexuality. Underneath all this macho behavior, underneath all this sort of jingoistic patriotism, uh, you find a terrifying fear that somebody, somewhere, might be queer. <laughs> and and that's the that's the sort of basis for the buddy film. I mean, homosexuality. People are always criticizing those of us who talk about buddy films, where there's no overt homosexuality, but where the the strongest, most loving, deepest relationships are between members of the same sex. And you're often criticized for saying that those films are about that because they. But the truth is that the only reason why you bring that up is because homosexuality as a concept arises naturally whenever two men in this society are close or emotional because they can't conceive a friendship between women or friendship between men that doesn't have some sort of a sexuality attached to it. We attach that sexuality to it just because of our national consciousness about these things. And so you do find characters that are terrified of being called queer. And so there's always that issue in those films. You know, yes, we love each other. Yes, we're close, but we're not fags. You know, so, so if they didn't have to say, but, but we're not queer, the issue wouldn't come up in the first place. They're not comfortable. And so a lot of these films that you're going to see today illustrate the difference between a real man and a sissy and what those things mean to our culture. Uh, that fear that of homosexuality expresses itself both in front of the camera and behind the camera, and certainly in the audience. Uh, the issue of male affection is the issue of, of masculinity. And I don't think you can remind people too many times, because it takes a long time for people to get it, that the reason why it's an insult to call a man effeminate is because it means he's like a woman and therefore not as good as a real man. And if we like women better, it wouldn't be an insult. It would be a compliment. And so the whole, the whole root, the fundamental basis for the way gay men are put down in society has to do with how we don't like women. And so therefore, if you're a man with power and if you're a man with status, it's an insult to call you something less than that. It demotes a man to the status of womanhood and therefore insults him. And so you have to think about the dynamic that makes a fag joke. Uh, the second sequence that you're going to see in some ways illustrates these issues. Uh, the first clip in this is a clip from uh, Making Love, which was a 1980 film uh, with Michael on Keen and Kate Jackson and Harry Hamlin. And the second one is from John Schlesinger's 1971 film, Sunday Bloody Sunday. And the third one is from Richard Brooks's uh, Looking for Mr. Goodbar from 1977. Uh, I'm sure that everybody in this audience, virtually everyone in this audience, has had the experience of seeing a film with an audience in a local theater where two men kiss. And you know what the reaction is. Everyone has their own story about how their, their audience reacted when two men kissed on the screen. There's always a vocal, violent reaction. And that's what I meant before when I was saying that the fear of homosexuality expresses itself 
on both sides of the, the camera and also in the audience. There's a fear going on there because they're tremendously threatened by seeing affection between members of the same sex. Talk a little bit more about how different it is for lesbians in terms of the public's perception of women relating to women. But here the fear comes very naturally. And I think that first you see the kiss in Making Love, then you see the kiss between two men in Sunday Bloody Sunday, and then finally in Looking for Mr. Goodbar, what you've got is an argument between two gay men, which is very vicious. And it's based on stereotypes of masculine gay or feminine gay. And we'll just, you know, talk a little bit about that when we've seen it. Okay. There's a whole issue uh, right now, well, there always has been, of uh, men kissing on the screen. Uh, just recently in the Rock Hudson television movie, it was, you know, once again shocking to people that he was very affectionate and sexual uh, and romantic with Phyllis Gates. And then when it came to all of the gay parts, there were sort of these handshakes, you know, and touches on the shoulder. <laughs> Uh, it's, you know, in spite of the fact that I really do believe that television has handled issues which surround lesbian and gay life and lesbian and gay politics in better ways than motion pictures have ever done because television is issue oriented. And, you know, in, another, in, in other words, uh, uh, middle American homes would never have received stories, for instance, like on, uh, lesbian custody cases with the, the one with Jenna Rollins and Jane Alexander called A Question of Love, which is based on a true story about a lesbian mother in Texas, or Sergeant Matlevich versus the Air Force, or the autobiography of Quentin Crisp. All of those are issues which would never have reached that wide public had it not been for the medium of television. So in many ways, television has, in fact, served these issues in a much better way than motion pictures. But the last taboo is still two men kissing, which has never been done on television. But the issue has always been an alive issue. Uh, there were outrageous uh, uh, reactions to, to these films. Uh, when Peter Finch made Sunday Bloody Sunday, he was interviewed in the London Times right after the film opened, and, they, and the reporter in London said to him, how could you do that? How could you bring yourself to kiss a man on the screen? And Peter Finch was great. He said, I closed my eyes and I thought about England. <laughs> Which is, I mean, but that's a famous line. I mean, in England, they used to, you know, turn of the century, they used to tell virgins that that's how you got through your wedding night. You close your eyes and you think about England. Uh, but this is, this is not a new thing. Uh, um, Richard Thomas, uh, who was John Boy Walton, played in Lanford Wilson's The Fifth of July on Broadway. And he had a scene at the top of the first act where he had to kiss Jeff Daniels, who played his lover. And he, sa he told me in an interview that, and this is sort of astonishing because it was Broadway and it's almost unheard of, but three times during the run of that show he had to bring down the curtain and make a speech to them and start over again because when he kissed Jeff Daniels, they started talking to one another. You know how people, when they get nervous, and they, don't, they, they sort of begin to chatter. And he said he could hear them across the footlights sort of buzzing and talking. And he had to bring down the curtain and say, listen, this play has major gay characters, and there's affection in this play. Please be quiet. And, you know, it's just a credible reaction. Uh, Christopher Reeve, who play, was in Death Trap with Michael Caine and kissed Michael Caine in Death Trap, told me that uh, the box office dropped $10,000 when Variety printed the fact that they kissed. Uh, $10,000 a week they lost because people simply did not want to see this. And so if you look at the way Hollywood approaches this stuff, they want to do it because it's sensational and it brings people in. At the same time, they're aware that the public has a distaste for this. They simply do not want to see it. And so look at, you look at the Making Love clip and you see that the audience is prepared for the kiss by distancing devices that the filmmaker uses. In other words, the first time they touch each other, it's in a long shot. The second time they touch each other, it's in a medium shot. And then they fall onto the bed, still mostly dressed. I mean, they only take off their shirts. 
Uh, and the camera pans to a mirror in the bedroom where there is all sorts of 60s bullshit hanging on it. Like, <laughs> you know, like globes and purple things and candles. And, and I don't think that's an accident. I think it confuses the eye of the viewer because you're viewing this through a mirror, first of all, which is a distancing advice for the audience. And second of all, you're not sure what you're looking at. <laughs> I mean, it's really true. And so uh, it's very unlike, for instance, um, uh, the way in which uh, the women make love in personal best. For, uh, in, in personal best, you've got two women naked making love. In making love, you've got all these devices to sort of distance you from lovemaking between men. And the reason for that is because they like it when two women make love together. I mean, that's one of their sexual turn-ons. If you look, for instance, at heterosexual pornography, you see that there's a lot of lesbianism in those things because that's a turn-on for, the, for a heterosexual male point of view about what sexuality is. And rarely in film history do you have women relating to women on their own terms that isn't a voyeuristic look at lesbianism from a male point of view and so very often you'll find explicit lovemaking between women on the screen where men on the screen makes them nuts and it just makes them crazy and they don't want to see it and if you look at, I think that the, the uh, John Schlesinger film, Sunday Bloody Sunday, is done in a more naturalistic way. I mean, it's spontaneous. There's no pandering to the audience. It's explicit. And I just don't think that he, con he concerned himself with what the audience reaction would be. In fact, on the day that they shot that scene, the cameraman said to John Schlesinger, just before he shot it, he looked at him and he said, John, is this really necessary? Can we cut this scene? I mean, everybody on the set was nervous about doing it, but Schlesinger directed it in a very naturalistic, you know, sort of very casual way. And yet it was still shocking to the audience. But the last scene in Looking for Mr. Goodbar, I think, illustrates this fear. What's going on there is that you've got an effeminate, older gay man and a butch, younger gay man who is a sort of hustler who claims not to be gay. And what he's saying, he's being kept by this guy. And what he's saying to him is, you're the Nelly, I'm not, I'm a pitcher, not a catcher, and don't you ever forget it. You know, what he's saying is, that I may be gay, but I'm butch. <clears throat> and this saves me psychologically and as existentially, because it means that I'm the man, so I don't want to abdicate my masculinity. And he's so terrified of being called queer that he is, in fact, the character in the film <clears throat> who eventually murders Diane Keaton because he goes to bed with her. He can't get it up. She laughs at him, and he kills her to defend his masculinity. And I think that this is a, a, a thread that runs through American film of the defense of masculinity causing violence in the culture, that people will defend their masculinity to the extent of hurting other people in order to save themselves from the label queer. And this is the same situation you find in William Friedkin's Cruising with Al Pacino, where a character goes into the male gay community and murders in homosexuals what he sees in himself, the possibility of his own homosexuality. So he's really killing his gayness by murdering gay men. And so you get, this is not, you know, uncommon. You get throughout film history the engenderment of violence as, as a reaction to the charge of homosexuality. You rarely get anti-gay violence or anti-lesbian violence, which is epidemic in this country. Instead, what you get is that the gay community is a violent place in which to live and that gay people are the perpetrators of violence rather than the victims of violence. And so uh, if you look at these films, you see what the audience wants. And Hollywood is very in tune to what the audience wants. The difference, for instance, between La Caja Foll and, and a film like Making Love, is, or, or even, even like the, the still unmade screen version of, of The Front Runner, is the reason they're afraid is that La Caja Foll doesn't involve sex. It involves non-threatening, sort of funny, 
acceptable drag queens. I'm not, not to say that there aren't some wonderful things in that film, because I still think it's a highly political film from a lesbian and gay point of view, from a reading as a gay person. But the reason why it was the most popular foreign film in American screen history was that these characters threatened no one. Gay people could feel superior to them. Heterosexual people could feel superior to them. They were drag queens. They had no power. They were easy to like. And they were, they didn't threaten anybody in the audience. And so, to a certain extent, you always have to, we're always bargaining. That's what I always find. Like, you know, people say, well, did you like it? Well, it's not as easy as did you like it? There were some terrific things in about it. And we were just looking at this, this film this weekend and a friend of mine said, it's always the same story. The things in it that are good are good and the things in it that are bad have to be called bad. And with making love, it was a situation where we're always being grateful to Hollywood for small favors. And those small favors in making love were that for the first time in movie history, two handsome movie stars took off their clothes and went to bed together. And so you had a situation where it was the first time a serious gay couple was ever permitted a happy ending on screen. And this is already 1982. And some, you know, the first time I ever saw a gay character on the screen, I was in high school. And it was Otto Preminger's film, Advising Consent, with Don Murray. And he slit his throat at the end, and I took that home with me. And I really did. I sort of thought, well, if this, if you're gay, this is it. This is the, this is the, what's going to happen to you. This is your fate. And now I think, well, at least, of, at the very least, in 1982, some 15-year-old kid in the Midwest is seeing his first gay character on screen, and the character is functional, attractive, there is no suicide. And so you always have to sort of think in terms of what, what good it's doing and then what's wrong with it and how can you fix that? How can you petition to have that fixed? And what I find about Making Love is that it was one of those films, like many TV movies, which had, had as its goal reaching the widest possible audience as possible without offending anyone. And that'll never produce radical politics on film. It will not ever even produce radical filmmaking aesthetically, because you really do have to please that audience. It reminds me of what Quentin Crisp was saying once when he was talking about this issue. And he said, you know, uh, I, I see people going on television and pleading tolerance for gay people based on the fact that they're just like everybody else. And I see that a lot, too. You should love us. You should pass laws. Uh, because, after all, we're just like you, basically. And there's an element of truth to that, unfortunately. I mean... <laughs> no, I mean <clears throat> and I say unfortunately because the truth is that 21 years ago, when we joined the Gay Activist Alliance and the, and the sort of modern-day gay militant movement was born, our battle cry was the same as it is today, come out. And then we looked around and we saw who came out and what they are are Americans. They are lesbians and gay men who are Americans. You know, we always say, you shouldn't be surprised at gay male sexism or racism because gay men are men. And they were socialized to be men, raised to be men. And unless they make the effort, you know, to change those things, they're going to be men. And I think the same thing is true of lesbians and gay men who are Americans. They were raised to be Americans, and they want to be part of the fabric of the culture. They're not radicals. The radicals in this country are both lesbian and gay and straight, and, and, and their sexuality is secondary to their radicalism as people. They want to change the culture. They want to change what this country is. But most people are not like that. That's just the truth, and it's hard to accept for us sometimes. We thought they were all going to come out of the closet and change society. They came out of the closet, and they want to open their own business. <laughs> you know, and so it's hard. And so what, what Quentin Crisp was saying was you cannot plead tolerance from a, for a group of people based on the fact that they're just like everybody else because tolerance is something that we extend to people who are not like everybody else, so that'll never work. Can't fool them. You have to tell them the truth. And so audiences were much more comfortable when homosexuality was humorous. Uh, if you look at the sissy characters of the 30s and the 40s, Franklin Pangborn, Eric Bloor, Grady Sutton, Edward Everett Horton, sometimes Clifton Webb, uh, they were never sexual in any way. Nobody ever wanted to go to bed with a man in a dress. 
You know, that was pointed out really brilliantly and outrageous with Craig Russell, this sort of drag queen, you know, and he said, you know, he said, he said, I remember the line in the movie, he looked at this hustler and he said, do you realize how it feels when a, a handsome man looks at you and all he sees is drag queen? And that has to do with the asexual nature of the sissy. The sissy is meant to be a joke. And the humor most often comes from some kind of misunderstanding. And it's different for lesbians. Uh, not when they get older, but young lesbians who are called tomboys. Tomboy doesn't have the same connotation as sissy. There's a certain amount of tolerance for women who behave in what is described as a masculine way until a certain age. You know, and then it changes. So that if you look at um, the difference between a sissy like Milton Berle in a dress is just an asexual joke, and a woman in a tuxedo like Garbo in Queen Christina or Dietrich in Morocco, uh, they were exotic and androgynous and sort of interesting and attractive and erotic to men and women in the audience because their appeal was that they were stepping up in class. You know, when a woman puts on a tuxedo, it's sex as power. She's suddenly donning the trappings of what we admire most, masculinity. And it's sort of attractive to us. If a man puts on a dress, he steps down in class, and he loses power, and he loses sex. And so the earliest gay male characters were funny and asexual, while the earliest lesbian characters were sort of predatory and exotic. And they were, they were sort of fascinating to all of us. Because what we were reacting to was clothing and as gender, you know? I mean, it's so interesting to me that more often than not, you're, you're labeled homosexual, not based on who you sleep with, but on how you behave. Behavior is, is the crucial question. When I was in high school, I remember one time I was walking down the hallway and I was carrying my books like this. <laughs> and, a friend of mine said to me, don't do that, that's queer. If you're a boy, you're supposed to carry books like this. And it reminded me that you are judged by, how, by these codes, by how you, are, how you behave and what you put out there about yourself. And so this, sequ this sequence that you're going to see now, beginning with the Charlie Chaplin film called Behind the Screen, which was made in 1916, has to do with... Um, with several issues, including these issues of demoting, uh, demoting gender, you know, by taking away masculinity or by adding femininity in some way. The first clip is the Chaplin clip behind the screen, and it has to do again with mistaken identity. There's a woman who couldn't get a job on a movie set unless she pretended to be a man because they weren't hiring women. And so she dresses as a man and she covers her hair with a hat. And everybody thinks she's a boy. And Chaplin thinks she's a boy. And he makes fun of her because she behaves like a woman. In other words, it's like a gay joke. And then suddenly he realizes her hat falls off. And he realizes he's dealing with a woman, and he begins to kiss her. But she puts her hat back on before he begins to kiss her, and everybody else around them thinks that Chaplin is kissing a boy. And so it's several levels of gender confusion to make this joke. The second one is one of the most astonishing things I've ever seen. It's a Laurel and Hardy short called Their First Mistake, made in 1932. And once again, this is just before the production code, so you could still get away with a lot of this stuff. And I think that one is just self-explanatory. You're not going to believe it. <laughs> and, and then finally, a series of very short clips illustrating some of the career of the most famous Hollywood sissy, Franklin Pangborn. Franklin Pangborn made a career out of playing these roles, and he was charming and funny, and everybody loved him. So the first one is Stage Door Canteen, where he falls into the arms of Johnny Weissmiller, who played Tarzan. Uh, a Star is Born, the first one with Janet Gaynor, 1937, where he plays a, re uh, a radio reporter who uses words like Devoon. Uh, <laughs> Easy Living, uh, a brief clip from Easy Living with Gene Arthur. Uh, and then uh, Only Yesterday. Only Yesterday was the only film in which um, Franklin Pangborn actually had a boyfriend. Uh, you know, he played these sort of quasi-gay characters that people could sort of go around saying, well, they weren't really homosexual. They were just sort of sissified characters. But in Only Yesterday, which was the year they changed the production code, 
he had a boyfriend named Robert, and there's only one brief scene with them, but it's it's sort of more you know more implicit than almost any other role he ever played. And then finally, closing with a, a brief sequence from Top Hat, which is a Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers musical, and this one uh, has Edward Everett Horton and Eric Bloor. Okay. <laughs> Oh, first of all, let me just make a comment about that Laurel and Hardy. Uh, this is the sort of thing where when I went on tour uh, with the Cellular Closet, I did a lot of radio shows and, you know, TV talk shows and stuff like that. And the bulk of their outrage was reserved for my treatment of buddy films in comedy and in drama. And they were outraged that I was saying that Laurel and Hardy were gay. You know, and I would always have to explain to them that I was not saying that Laurel and Hardy was, were gay. What I was saying was that they used the idea of homosexuality as humor, and it was just ridiculous of us to think that they didn't realize what they were doing, because they were very smart, and they used these issues in their comedy brilliantly. And so that I was not saying that these characters were gay. I was saying that homosexuality as an issue arose naturally out of their routines. And that's the way it is with a lot of these sequences where, where homosexuality is the implicit joke in something that is really not about homosexuality. And because it flourished so well in comedy throughout those years, the 30s and the 40s, uh, animated films have always used the same devices. And if you look at Saturday morning cartoons, you, they still do use those devices, the sort of dichotomy between the sissy and the bully. All of those issues still exist in, in, in cartoons that are made today. Many of the mistaken identity devices, uh, the conventions of live action films were used in, 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 um, in, in animation sequences. And so this next sequence is a sequence of um, animation in which gay characters arise explicitly and implicitly. Uh, and, and some of them, quite shockingly, the first one especially, uh, has an actual homosexual character in a Flip the Frog cartoon from 1933 called The Soda Squirt. And the rest of them are uh, various, the, the, the stuff that I know I used to see on Saturday afternoons, uh, pirate cartoons in particular. Uh, there was always sort of a gay pirate in there, uh, used as, as the brunt of violence by the other pirates. You'll notice that in most of these clips, there's a lot of violence against the characters once they're identified as gay. Uh, and of course, in here, there are, there's a lot of Bugs Bunny, because uh, Bugs was always in drag, and he was always marrying Elmer Fudd. Uh, <laughs> And so this is a series of animation from anywhere from 1933 through 1956 uh, showing gay references in animation. <laughs> I think just in general it's insufficiently appreciated how much uh, lesbian and gay reference uh, existed on screen before the production code banned all reference to gay people in 1934. Uh, the sequence that I'd like you to see is a sequence of films which, uh, in which there were gay references and gay characters just around the period of time. I don't think any of these, these sequences is later than 1934. But it was around 1933, October 1933, that the production code finally banned not only references to any, any, any reference to homosex, to the existence of homosexuality. I mean, you could not only, you know, you, you, not only could you not, uh, do something gay in a film or say something gay, but you could not make reference to the fact that such people existed, not even by inference. And so, in fact, it was, it, it successfully, except for subtextual homosexuality in film noir of the 40s, which a lot of references sort of slipped through because they weren't explicit. It said uh, all references to sex perversion or any influence or any inference to it are forbidden. And this was not only, you know, with gay subject matter, uh, the code which was drawn up by the Motion Picture Producers Association in 1932 banned all reference to abortion, 
um, prostitution, suicide, murder going unpunished. Uh, you could, that's where you got twin beds in motion pictures. Heterosexual married people could no longer sleep in a double bed. And there were all sorts of references that you simply could not have, including a long list of words which could no longer be used on the screen. And the reason why this happened was because there were, in the state legislatures of 17 separate states in 1933, there were censorship bills pending, which meant that there would be federal censorship of the movies. And in order to stave off federal censorship, the Motion Picture Producers Association agreed that they would police the industry and they would stick by their own rules. So they drew up a series of guidelines which they promised to adhere to. And those guidelines stayed in effect from 1933 until 1961. And in fact, in 1961, the last taboo was homosexuality. All of the other taboos had been eroded by the beginning of the 1960s, except the statute against showing homosexual activity. But these were films which appeared just before the code was put into effect. And they'll give you some sort of an idea of why censorship came in, because they were becoming more and more explicit every year. The first is a, is a sequence from Morocco with Dietrich uh, in a cafe sequence, which she helped write. I mean, she and von Sternberg worked on this sequence together, and most of it was her idea. The second is two sequences from Queen Christina, Queen Christina was the Queen of Sweden uh, in, in the mid-16 and late 1600s. She was a, a lesbian who, in fact, abdicated the throne of Sweden in order not to marry. And when they brought it to Hollywood, well, the, the best way to illustrate what happened <laughs> was that uh, actually Christina did, in fact, abdicate the throne and spent most of her life with a beautiful countess named Ebba Spar, with whom she was in love. Uh, and in 1932, there was a book written about her by Margaret Goldsmith, and it was called Christina of Sweden, a Psychological Study. And it was a sort of, you know, psychological portrait of this woman. And it made it very clear that she was a lesbian. And the Herald Tribune in New York reviewed the book, and they said, the facts are abundant that the Queen of Sweden was a lesbian, but will Miss Garbo play such a character in Ruben Mamoulian's film scheduled to be released next year. And following year, the film opened, and the reviewer, the same reviewer who had reviewed Goldsmith's book, reviewed the movie. And in reference to it, uh, because when the movie opened, she abdicates the throne of Sweden in order to marry John Gilbert, uh, the emissary from the King of Spain, uh, although there is one brief scene in the beginning of the film with a character named Ebba Spar, played by Elizabeth Young. Uh, but then that sort of recedes, and it has a traditional heterosexual ending. They made her heterosexual. Um, and he said in his review of the film, but what do facts and theories matter? To those of us who see Garbo and Queen Christina, the Queen of Sweden will always remain the beautiful young girl who fell in love with the Spanish ambassador in the snow, and no amount of professional research is ever going to change that. <laughs> and so it's a very, I mean, it's a good quote because it shows exactly what they were saying. They were saying, look, we don't want to know what the truth was. Movies are made for fantasy. We want our fantasy, the fantasy of the majority. And so consistently, b biographies of famous people who happened to be lesbian or gay were altered and laundered. Uh, but these are two interesting sequences from Queen Christina because not only was the script by a woman <coughs> named Salco Verto, but also Garbo's own personality brought an androgyny to the role that wasn't in the script. And so it's a very interesting dynamic going on. Uh, a very brief scene from a film called Wonder Bar with Al Jolson. Uh, a, a rare film called Blood Money, 1933, which showed sort of a, a demimonde of gangsters, prostitutes, pimps, gay characters, all sorts of cross-dressing. It's one of the most unusual films, rare to see. Uh, a film called Irene from 1925, which eventually became a Broadway musical with an effeminate uh, costume designer model. Uh, she Done Him Wrong, a Mae West film from 1933, which has two gay prisoners in a jail cell, uh, who Mae West, by the way, refers to as the Cherry Sisters. Uh, in the movie and also uh, in real life, she worked in vaudeville with an act called the Cherry Sisters, who were so bad that people threw food at them. Uh, 
a, a really rare and interesting movie, which never gets shown anymore, called The Warrior's Husband, 1933, about an Amazon society of women who ran the state and fought the wars, and the men took the female role, and the humor in the film came out of the role reversal. Uh, Broadway Melody of 1929 had one of the classic costume designer gay characters, uh, Call Her Savage, was a film with Clara Bow in 1933, which visited what was probably the first representation of a New York City gay bar in 1930s. And this is the sort of clip where if you watch it, you get it, because there's a drag act going on. But if you have to watch it two or three times, because you look in the background, I mean, it only lasts a few seconds. And you do see women dressed in men's smoking jackets with their arms around one another and men holding hands. But it goes by real quickly, but it was the first representation of what a gay bar may have been like in the 30s in Greenwich Village. Uh, a, a sequence from a, a movie by Raoul Walsh called Sailor's Luck, also in 1933, takes place in a, in a bathhouse and has two major gay characters. Uh, another effeminate costume designer who's part of, integrated into the family of a theatrical company backstage. And finally, a clip from... Uh, Harold Lloyd's comedy, Movie Crazy, in which Grady Sutton jumps on the top of a table at the sight of a mouse, and it sort of makes that connection clear of what did, what created the sissy, and what created the sissy was the way women were supposed to behave. Okay. There was, in the 1960s, when the code was dismantled, a sort of cruel edge to the subtext which emerged during the code. You know, uh, sissies during the 1930s were sort of benign, and everybody's friend, and the audience liked them, and the people in the films liked them. You know, it was Fred Astaire's valet, or the best friend, and they were part of the family in the film, and everybody found them charming and amusing. But that all changed when the code was dismantled, and in the 1960s, gay characters became explicitly gay, and they became threatening, and then they had to be punished, and there was a moral judgment made on them. Uh, and they virtually disappeared as charming, funny uh, characters, until Victor Victoria in 1982. And it was because Victor Victoria was a throwback to the 1930s that they could do the old-fashioned, charming, asexual sissy. Uh, Toddy, played by Robert Preston, was a natural extension of the sort of sissies of the 1930s. And it works because Blake Edwards anachronistically creates a sort of 1970s sexual freedom dialogue, but in a 1930s context. This didn't work for everybody, but I sort of th thought it was, it was an interesting design for the movie. The problem with the movie was that he didn't trust the audience. Uh, Julie Andrews is, 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 is in love with James Garner, and James Garner falls in love with her thinking that this is a man impersonating a woman. And it's not until he ascertains that he's really dealing with a woman, he hides in her bathroom and watches her undress, and then he determines that it's really a woman in disguise, and then he kisses her. And when we did this interview with Blake Edwards, he said... You could not push the audience that far. You could not allow them to think that a straight man was falling in love with another man and not understanding why, because then they get hostile and it's not comedy anymore. He had to know she was a woman before he made his move. And I think he didn't, you know, he didn't trust them enough to make it a radical statement about sexuality. Uh, even in the scene where Alex Karras and Robert Preston are in bed, it's sort of a, a Lacaja full throwback. It's asexual, just the way it would have been in the 1930s. They both have pajamas on, buttoned up to their neck. They have their hands folded in their laps. It's a one-joke scene. Never during Victor Victoria did you think of those characters as in any way explicitly sexual. Uh, I want to show a sequence, though, from Victor Victoria here, because I think it raises all of the issues that the film tried to raise in a comic context. First, it's the confrontation between Julie Andrews and James Garner about masculinity, and then it's a very, very funny confrontation between Leslie Ann Warren and Robert Preston. Uh, the period of the code, and I really used Victor Victoria to sort of 
you know, conclude that sort of charming sissy image. Uh, and I think it worked very well there as humor. But again, you can see that when it's set in the 1930s and it's a sissy, it's not sexual. And, you know, I told you the story about what happened during the code in terms of Queen Christina and how a lesbian monarch who actually lived was changed into a heterosexual. And, and that sort of happened throughout the 30s and the 40s and the 50s. These three was the Lillian Hellman film based on her play The Children's Hour, where two school teachers accused of lesbianism were a change to a heterosexual adulterous triangle. Uh, in 1936. If you read Dashiell Hammett, for instance, uh, it's very clear that in the Maltese Falcon, Sam Spade's secretary identifies the Peter Lorre character as a homosexual, but in the film it's very ambiguous. And if you talk to gay people who were in their sort of 20s and the 40s and saw that movie, they'll tell you that they perceived that the Peter Lorre character was gay, and they perceived that there was a gay relationship between Elisha Cook Jr. and Sidney Greenstreet, but that in fact it was so subliminal that most of the audience didn't see it unless they were looking for it. In 1945, there was a film with Ray Milan called The Lost Weekend, that alcoholic. This is based on a novel by a gay novelist called Charles Jackson, who wrote several books with major gay characters. And in the book, he was an alcoholic because he couldn't come to terms with his, with his homosexuality. And they just simply erased that for the film version. Uh, in 1947, there was a novel called The Brick Foxhole, written by Richard Brooks, who directed Looking for Mr. Goodbar, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. He wrote this novel about three American servicemen who take an interior, de a gay interior decorator home uh, and then the next morning, they're so ashamed of what they've done, they murder him and they bury his body in the woods. They made a movie out of this novel called Crossfire, and they changed the victim to a Jew so that it could be a story of anti-Semitism. Uh, constantly this happened, even later in the 1960s when you were allowed to show homosexuality on the screen. The villain could be gay, but never the hero, so that you lost... Uh, something like 17 separate sequences from Carl Foreman's anti-war film in 1963 called The Victors because they showed American soldiers sleeping with French, young French boy prostitutes in exchange for food. Uh, the original screenplay for Dr. Strangelove had the President of the United States played by Peter Sellers as um, a homosexual. Uh, in addition to being an incompetent fool. And, I mean, as we all know, the President of the United States can be an incompetent fool, but not a homosexual. And they, <coughs> and they changed that in script development. Uh, Spartacus, with, there was a sequence cut between Laurence Olivier and Tony Curtis, which established a sexual relationship between them. Uh, Laurence of Arabia was altered in script before 1965, the original notes for the script described the sexuality of Lawrence, of T. Lawrence, and essentially said, uh, there is nothing to be gained by exploiting the fact that Lawrence may have had an or unorthodox sexuality. This, however, does not mean that the evil Turkish Bey cannot be portrayed as a homosexual because it will heighten his villainy. Uh, in Bonnie and Clyde, the original script for Bonnie and Clyde was based on newspaper accounts and reports that Bonnie Parker and Clyde Barrow were in fact bisexual and that they hired a series of young men to drive their car who slept with them. And there was a sequence in the film uh, with C.W. Moss, Bonnie Parker, and Clyde Barrow in bed together after having had sex. But they cut this because when Arthur Penn signed to direct the movie, he pointed out that the Warren Beatty character could be a killer and still a hero, but not a sexually ambiguous killer, because at that point you would lose the audience sympathy for the character, and you had to have it. And so that was changed. His sexual problem was changed to impotence in Barney and Clyde. And so biographies followed during the 40s and the 50s the same way of, of portraying these characters. Uh, Lieutenant Charles Gordon of India played as heterosexual uh, by Charlton Heston in Night and Day, Cole Porter, 
his life story was was completely altered for the screen with the help of Cole Porter, who wanted himself presented as heterosexual. Alexander the Great with Richard Burton, with uh, Hans Christian Andersen with Danny Kaye, all of Tennessee Williams. I mean, it was too early in 1952 to film Streetcar Named Desire. They they really shouldn't have even they should have waited because it lost all key references to Blanche's husband's homosexuality. Cat on a Hot Tin Roof in 1958. Uh, it was incredible. I mean, you, you practically had to have Tennessee Williams sitting with you in the movie theater to explain to you why is Paul Newman not sleeping with Elizabeth Taylor? It was like a mystery movie. Uh, it was like... But an extraordinary thing happened at the end of the 1950s. The Catholic Legion of Decency, which was so powerful in the 1950s that it could actually prevent a movie from opening in the United States, in cooperation with the Motion Picture Association, gave special permission for Sam Spiegel to produce and Joe Mankiewicz to direct Suddenly Last Summer, based on a one-act play by Tennessee Williams in 1959. And the Catholic Church explained that Although this film dealt with sexual perversion, it could be considered moral because it showed the horror and degradation of such a lifestyle. So this play, which was about a doomed homosexual poet, uh, was allowed to be filmed with Catherine Hepburn, Montgomery Clift, and Elizabeth Taylor. And in the film, Sebastian, the gay character, uh, who is dead by the time the curtain comes up, but is seen in flashback, is shown only from the back. You never see his face. And in fact, it's perfectly analogous to a horror movie, which many gay films are. You look at the 50s alien monster creature films, and you look at the way gay films were plotted and the way the subtextual attitudes in them, and you see the gay character as alien, not only alien to his society, but to the family from which that gay character came. Unlike other minority groups, the parents of gay people are alien to who they are. And so the discovery of a creature in the midst of normal society was a device that was used to portray gay characters throughout the 50s and 60s. So that if you compare James Whale's 1930 film Frankenstein with Boris Karloff with Suddenly Last Summer, you will see that the last five minutes of each of those films are exactly the same shot and plotting. The monster is pursued by the peasants with torches to the top of a hill where he is destroyed for the good of society. He's an unnatural creature, a thing that shouldn't have happened, something against God and nature. And if you look at Suddenly Last Summer, Catherine Hepburn is literally the mad creator of a creature that did not belong among normal people. And at the end, Sebastian is followed to the top of a hill by peasant children who he has exploited for sexually for money and is murdered by an outraged society at this monster in their midst, torn to pieces with broken bottles and tin cans and eaten alive, cannibalized. And it was, I mean, the funny part is that when the Catholic newsletter reviewed the film, they said that this shows one of the more commoner fates of the homosexual. <laughs> uh, I mean, see, how many people do you know personally that this has happened to? Uh, but what this film did was to create the 60s. It was the threshold of the 1960s, and it created a kill them or cure them climate where the homosexual either committed suicide or was murdered or was cured, like they say in Victor Victoria, by enough attention from the opposite sex so that you got films like Rod Steiger in The Sergeant. He kisses John Philip Law and then blows his brains out with a shotgun in the woods. The Fox with Anne Haywood and Sandy Dennis where these two women are living together and a man comes between the relationship and... What happens is that a tree falls between Sandy Dennis's legs, the irony of which should not escape you. Uh, and Anne Haywood goes off into the sunset with the man, you know, killing one and curing one before the end of the third reel. Uh, there was an Otto Preminger film called Tell Me That You Love Me, Junie Moon with Liza Minnelli. And the gay character sleeps with a prostitute on the beach, and the next morning he announces that he's cured. This happened in Altman's film, MASH. It happened constantly throughout the 50s and 60s. The issue here was still American masculinity, and it still is. I mean, if you read the front page of the New York Times about how George Bush had to squash his wimp image in, by invading Panama, you realize that this is still what's going on in this culture. 
you know, the, the, the maintenance of that image of, of masculinity was paramount importance. And, to, and I want to close this section with two sequences from films 25 years apart, which use those, those images. First, from Tea and Sympathy, which is a film made in 1956 based on the play by Robert Anderson. And it's about a heterosexual young man who is accused of homosexuality. That was another theme in the early 60s, was that the gay character is never really gay. It was just an unfounded, slanderous accusation which forced them to commit suicide, even though it wasn't true. You know, and that's, the, the Tea and Sympathy is a fine film in many ways, and a fine play, because it talks about the generic idea of difference, about how society is totally intolerant of anyone who doesn't behave the way they're supposed to behave. So here you have this kid who's not gay, who is accused of being gay because of his behavior. And this is the scene in which he is taught how to walk like a man by his roommates so that the other students won't make fun of him. And I want to compare it to La Caja Folle which 25 years later uses virtually the same sequence when Renato teaches Alban how to walk like John Wayne so, and, and tries to teach him how to be a man so that they can fool these moral majoritarians that they're going to have dinner with that night so they won't know that they're gay. And, of course, the funny part is that, you know, Alban is a drag queen. He's never going to pass for straight. He's one of those people for whom passing is not an option. And so... <laughs> And so, during the sequence, it, it, it becomes, it's much more political because it becomes a deeper illustration of, of how people are what they are and that you're not going to twist them into a pretzel to be something they're not. It's just not going to happen. And I read a review once of La Caja Folle, which for me was a really interesting uh, illustration of why this film has an appeal for gay people. Because it's about passing. There was a, a, a reviewer in the Body Politic in Toronto who said that the drag queen, Alban, runs through the film screeching at the top of his voice, I am a, je suis un monstre, I am a monster, I am a monster. And he said, you know something, I think I really identified who the monster really is in La Caja Folle. It's the son of Renato who forces his father and his mother to behave differently and is ashamed of them and forces them to try to pretend to be something they're not. And La Caja Folle is about that. It's about the accommodations that lesbians and gay men have made through the centuries in order to make the straight world feel more comfortable with their presence by hiding, by not being what they are, by saying, I know that if I pass for what you are, you'll leave me alone. And, and that's, in fact, what Anita Bryant said in 1977. She didn't say, I hate homosexuals. She said, I'm only against the ones who try to come out of the closet and be militant. If they stayed in the closet, we wouldn't bother them. And that's what La Caja Folle about. It's about passing when, in fact, the beauty of a person's diversity is crushed by a society that requires you to behave like that. So these are those two sequences. Okay. Because of films like Tea and Sympathy, and for economic reasons, the code was changed, I quote, in October of 1961, to keep in closer harmony with our culture, our mores, our values, and the expectations of our time, homosexuality and other sexual aberrations may now be portrayed on the screen with care, discretion, and restraint. <laughs> that was the code ruling. Uh, and it was, in fact, for economic reasons, because what was happening at that time was that people were staying home and watching television suddenly. And if they were going to the movies, they weren't going to American films. They were going to foreign films. They were seeing English films and German films. And so if you compare, for instance, post-production post, you know, code films from Europe with post-production code films from the United States, you see what the difference was, and you also see what the phrase care, discretion, and restraint meant. What it meant was that in Europe, they began to really integrate lesbian and gay characters into films, and in America, they used it as a sort of sensationalistic, dirty secret, which got people back away from their television sets and back into the theaters by using this sensational subject matter. Uh, for instance, in England, they were making films like Victim with Dirk Bogard, which is a blackmail thriller about 
homosexual blackmail. The L-shaped room with Leslie Caron, which had an, uh, a really beautifully done sympathetic uh, lesbian character played by Cecily Courtenage, a vaudevillian, and also the first gay black male character in the movies. Uh, a Taste of Honey with Rita Tishingham, which had her best friend in the film as a gay man who sees her through her pregnancy. On the other hand, in the United States, they were making films like Advising Consent, where a United States senator is accused of homosexuality and slits his throat in the end, played by Don Murray. The Children's Hour was filmed again for the second time, this time with Audrey Hepburn and Shirley MacLaine, and Shirley MacLaine hangs herself at the end of the film. Walk on the Wild Side, where Barbara Stanwyck is sent to prison and her lover, Coppicine, is shot. Uh, and these, these films hit the public like sort of like a bombshell. They were on the front page of Life magazine. There were huge, extensive stories about the new frankness in movies and how homosexuality was finally becoming a part of the scene. And the critics in America reacted very negatively towards this. Most critics confused their critical faculty with their distaste for homosexual subject matter. Pauline Kael, uh, when she saw Victim, said, I despair now of the future of the cinema, that we are going to treat homosexuals with sympathy and respect like Negroes and Jews. The social workers of this country now have a new group of unfortunates that they can clasp to their bosoms. Uh, when, when, when the Children's Hour opened, she said, uh, the audience is supposed to feel sorry for Audrey Hepburn and Shirley MacLaine because, after all, they never do anything with each other, but they are punished. Uh, I thought that that's why we were all supposed to feel sorry for lesbians, because there's nothing that they can do with each other. Uh, <clears throat> in Time magazine, when Victim opened, they said, all of the homosexuals in this film are fine fellows. All of the villains in this film are heterosexual. Nowhere in this film does it say that homosexuality is a pernicious but curable disease which attacks the biological basis of life itself. And so, and so what happened was that in the 60s, as homosexual characters were introduced into American motion pictures, they emerged as alien creatures, as the monsters we talked about before, and they were seen through a sort of keyhole. Uh, most filmmakers, shot these sequences of gay bars in New York City and San Francisco and Los Angeles almost as a voyeuristic exercise for an American public that had never seen such creatures before. This was the underside of American life where violence and tragedy happened. And they were really put on parade as a, a sort of freak show. And our objections to these sequences are not so much in point in inaccuracy. You know, because if you look at these gay bars, yeah, there were bars like that. You know, but the point of view. So while you watch this next sequence, I'd like you to notice the way the filmmaker chooses to put the audience in the filmmaker's point of view, the editing, the scoring, musical scoring of the sequences, the point of view of the character. You are meant to share the point of view of the filmmaker to the extent that even the gay characters in these sequences are horrified by what they see. They are closeted gay characters or falsely accused characters who are seeing gay life for the first time and are appalled by what they see. And you're meant to share their disgust in advising consent when he comes into the gay bar scene, to the gay bar, and he reacts so strongly. That's the point of view of the director and, and allegedly of the audience. In The Killing of Sister George, when Coral Brown, who is a closeted lesbian, is exposed to the lesbian bar scene, she has the exact same reaction, and she has a, a revulsion to this sequence. So what the, the, the films that you're going to see sequences from here are advising consent, 1962, The Killing of Sister George, 1968, which, by the way, got an X rating because of a 119 seconds of very explicit lesbian lovemaking, uh, when the director, Robert Aldrich, offered to cut that sequence in order to get an R rating, they said, it doesn't matter, it's still an X, because the X is based on subject matter, so no matter what you do to it, it's still an X. In other words, the lesbianism itself produced the X rating on this film. Uh, from the trailer from Boys in the Band, The Coming Attractions. Just to give you an idea of the way the Boys in the Band was advertised to the general public. Uh, a gay bar scene from The Laughing Policeman, shot in 1972 in San Francisco by Stuart Rosenberg. Uh, there are many clips here from Boys in the Band, all of which make points that I think will be completely obvious to you without my help. 
uh, a brief trailer for television for cruising, which gives you the idea that homosexuality is seductive and contagious, and that if you hang around these people long enough, you'll get to be just like them. Uh, the Children's Hour, the confrontation scene between Audrey Hepburn and Shirley MacLaine, which is about self-hatred. Uh, uh, also, the, the last sequences from Suddenly Last Summer um, and The Boys in the Band, uh, a really interesting character from Next Stop Greenwich Village, which I still think, in spite of Enemies of Love Story, uh, is Paul Mazursky's best film from 1975, uh, a black gay man in 1950s Greenwich Village who sort of talks about how he's surrounded by heterosexual people who are sympathetic to him, but that he has no reference to gay life except sex and how sad he is about that. And it works really well. Uh, finally, from uh, an interesting liberal film from 1968 called The Detective with Frank Sinatra, where Sinatra plays a liberal crusading detective who sends the, uh, a gay man to the electric chair for committing murder and then belatedly finds out that he was innocent and that the, the man who really committed the murder was a closeted married gay man who murdered in order that he not be discovered as a homosexual. And when the screenwriter, Abby Mann, was asked why he wrote this screenplay, he said, I wanted to show that in American society's eyes, homosexuality is considered worse than murder. And uh, finally, uh, there is a sequence in here of the last scene from uh, The Killing of Sister George. And I use that in this sequence because um, it's a scene where Sister George has everything taken away from her, her lover, her job, her visibility, and she's an actress. And the only part she's offered at the end of the film is the part of a cow in an animated children's series. And what they're saying there is that she's so offensively butch, so outrageous, and refuses to hide, refuses to pass, that her punishment is invisibility. And the film ends with a character I like very much. I think Sister George is an astonishingly good character, and if there was any justice, Beryl Reed would have won an Oscar for it. Uh, but she, in, she ends by smashing the television studio, which is a symbol of the illusions that we create to pass. You know, this sequence was not designed to cheer you up. Uh, but this is uh, one of the things that desperately needs to be pointed out about this is that if you were 15 years old in 1962, this is the only reference point you had for being lesbian or gay in this country on the screen. And, you know, a lot of the times when we talk about the diversity of heterosexual people and their images in the media, people forget you know, that a lot of this stuff would have stood on its own because the truth is that Mark Crowley and the Boys in the Band was writing from the point of view of gay people who came out of the 50s and 60s. He was writing about self-hatred. There was nothing wrong with that. You know, Stuart Byron once said something that I think was brilliant. You know, we were outside the theater in 1970 picketing the boys in the band, saying why we thought it was offensive and all this. And Stuart said, I don't get it. If gay men weren't really like that in the 50s and 60s, then why did we need gay liberation? Of course they were. And he was right. But when you take a film like that and you typify millions of lesbians and gay men with it, something is wrong. You know, and if every heterosexual who ever appeared on screen committed suicide in the end of the film, people would think something was wrong too. And so it's the isolation of these things that causes stereotypes. And when you discuss gay sensibility, and you talk, you know, people, people are always saying, well, is there a gay sensibility? And what is, what, you know, how do you decide what's a gay film? You know, is a gay film a film made by gay people? Is it, a, is it a film about gay people? Is it a film in which gay characters appear? Does it have to have po po politics? And I think that the gay sensibility is going to disappear, and I find that unfortunate, but it comes from a ghetto mentality. Gay sensibility, if there, if there is such a thing, comes from the fact that lesbians and gay men throughout most of their lives had to hide what they were, and then because of that, they had to develop a secret language to recognize each other, a code where you could find other people who were like you. I was on a panel once in New York called, Is There a Gay Sensibility and Does It Have an Impact on Our Culture? And there was like me, Arthur Bell, Ed White, Kate Millett, a whole bunch of people, and Jeff Weinstein from The Village Voice said, no, there's no such thing as a gay sensibility, and yes, it has an enormous impact on the culture. <laughs>
which is really the perfect answer because because if there is such a thing it's a hidden sensibility and it's difficult to explain why in many cases it's very funny there was an actor named Ernest Thesiger he played Dr. Pretorius in The Bride of Frankenstein and he was gay and he's you know long gone now but a friend of mine knew him years ago and knew that he had been in World War I in the trenches and he said, Ernest, what was it like in the trenches? And Thesiger said, oh, my dear, the noise, the people. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's gay sensibility. You know, it's just a, it's like when, uh, it's like when Franny, Le Franny Leibowitz in the New York Times said, if you take the gay sensibility out of all of American popular culture, what you'd be left with, essentially, is let's make a deal. Uh, but... But it also con it also connected us, you know. I I can't go into the whole thing, but you have to realize that when we were, I mean, for me, it was Rebel Without a Cause. It was when James Dean looked at Salminio and zipped up his jacket at the end of the film and said, "Poor kid was always cold," you know, or Garbo and Queen Christina, or you know, any of those films when you when you sort of you sat in the audience and you were 15 years old and you thought. This has something to do with my life, even if I'm not sure what it is yet. Even before you knew the word for what you were, there was something that you were connecting with. And I think that was part of the sensibility that was operating in Hollywood. And if you take a good look at Hollywood today, uh, it's apparent that we've regressed in terms of gay sensibility. Gay people really are polarized between the sort of comedy we saw in the 30s and the tragedy of the 60s and 70s. I mean, just reading some of the titles, Windows, about a psychotic lesbian killer who murders heterosexual women. Uh, Elizabeth Ashley, 1981, no bullshit. Uh, Road Warrior. You know, which is a perfect analogy for the destruction of the heterosexual family unit by these leather queens. You know, uh, it's, it's the, it's the post-nuclear society, and if we're gonna survive, the homosexuals have to be defeated. Uh, cruising, once bitten, uh, teen wolf, St. Elmo's fire, uh, night shift, Henry Winkler, uh, you know, uh, Hollywood shuffle, all of the Brat Pack films, every single one of them, the Porky movies, the Meatball movies, you know, all these teenage comedies, uh, Russell's Rhapsody, Beverly Hills Cop, all of Eddie Murphy's concert movies, Good Morning Vietnam, Baby Boom, No Way Out, Moon Over Parador, Bull Durham, Punchline, Roadhouse, See No Evil, Hear No Evil, Heathers, Earth Girls Are Easy, Cold Feet. These are all movies with major faggot and dyke jokes in them. You can't go to a movie now where you don't hear some sort of insulting thing against lesbians and gay men. Never before in the history of Hollywood have screenwriters felt so comfortable being anti-gay. And in a way that they, they're not, they realize now that it's socially unacceptable to be anti-Semitic or racist, which does not mean that they're not anti-Semitic or racist. It means that they've, to some degree in public, learned their lesson. But they haven't learned that lesson with gays. It's still the last minority in this country, safe to insult with impunity. No one, no one complains, not even gay people themselves, because they're busy watching Batman and laughing at jokes about themselves. I run into gay men on the street and I say, did you see No Way Out? Oh yeah, it was a great movie. Yeah, but it didn't it bother you that the only gay character in the film was a villain who gets killed at the end? Oh yeah, there was that one little thing, but wasn't it a great movie? They're trained not to see it, and even worse, they're trained not to react to it because they really feel like there's nothing that they can do about it. You know, and we talked about biographies that make characters straight in a chorus line. They cut out half the gay monologue because according to Richard Attenborough, you have to deal with AIDS in the 80s if you're going to deal with gays. Uh, Spielberg cuts half the lesbian monologue out of Color Purple. Uh, some kind of hero, The Last Emperor, about the Emperor of China, who was certainly sexually ambiguous, uh, but not in Bertolucci's film. My Brilliant Career, which was about a lesbian feminist, not just a feminist. So they took that part out. Empire of the Sun. If you read the book, the John Malkovich character is gay, but not in Spielberg. Spielberg's film, and all of this is complicated by AIDS. The, uh, I hope we have that next sequence uh, and that this is going to work all right. I want to open with, I just want to show two very short sequences which have references uh, to AIDS in a subliminal way. Fatal Attraction and the remake of Cronenberg's The Fly. And if you look at Fatal Attraction, it's emblematic of Hollywood's new morality. 
in this case. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's Hollywood's response to AIDS without having to make any movies about AIDS. It's about the new morality and the family's triumphs in the end of it. With Glenn Close as the moral lesson of what can happen to you if you cheat on your wife once. If you don't live in a monogamous family unit. She becomes the disease. She becomes this knife-wielding thing that will kill you if you are promiscuous. And in The Fly, I think you'll recognize explicit references in the dialogue to, again, going back to suddenly last summer, the monster, the creature, the alien that has to be destroyed in order for society. He tampered with the laws of God, and now his body is falling apart. He has a rare form of cancer, as it's described in the film. His lymph nodes are swollen. I mean, that's exactly what the dialogue says. And those things are no accident. So we're going to look at those two, and then we only have one sequence left, which I will close with, uh, from my beautiful laundry at Desert Hearts and Parting Glances. <clears throat> I guess the only thing we really have time for in terms of summing up is to talk about how, as a community, we are have been, and I think you can see that from what you've seen today, constantly under siege by a media that's not controlled by people who have our best interests in mind. And I think that's not only true. That's not only true of gays. That's been true of women, minorities, people of color. In every marginalized way, people like that have been ignored and stepped on in order to promote a dominant ideology, which I think does not work anymore, and that they're just living through the motions. And what I'm saying is that I would like to propose no more films about homosexuality from Hollywood because I'm tired of putting up with their bullshit in a lot of ways and I'm tired of sort of waiting for them to serve a community that they're not prepared to serve. And I don't see black faces on the American screen. You know, it's no accident that I see Eddie Murphy, Whoopi Goldberg, Bill Cosby, and Richie Pryor and that those four people who make money in this country who are people of color are comics. You know, I don't think it's an accident that they're comics. I don't think it's an accident that there are no black leading men and leading women on the screen. Uh, I don't think it's an accident that I don't see Asian faces on the screen or Latina faces on the screen or even old people. Movies in this country are made for white heterosexual teenagers. That's Hollywood's job. It, Hollywood is an amusement park for adolescents where they make movies for people who have the money to pay $7. But I, you know, I'm not saying that I don't have a good time at Indiana Jones. I mean, I like Star Wars. That's fun. But that's what Hollywood does best. And you don't go to Hollywood for something that it doesn't know how to do. You know, alternatively, the, the so-called gay new wave in independent films are films for grown-ups who are intelligent and sort of interested in different kinds of characters and different kinds of stories. And they're characterized very explicitly by a post-gay liberation politic by a, with a candor about sex and a rejection of hetero, hetero imitative values. Films which refuse to be defined by straight expectations, something that Hollywood is based on. Which is why in the last decade we've gotten the times of Harvey Milk and Abuse and Buddies and Donna Herlinda and her son and what have I done to deserve this, and Law of Desire, Before Stonewall, Silent Pioneers, Prick Up Your Ears, Morris, Torch Song Trilogy, We Think the World of You, Wonderland. I mean, these are all film experiences which you need to, f to seek out in order to have, because they're not what's available. You know, instead of seeing Batman twice, you see Batman once, and then you go to something that you think might speak not only to your life, but to the diversity of who lives on this planet. You know, and, and, and I think that that effort needs to be made on a community level because they don't make films that don't make money. And if you stop going, they'll stop making them. You know? I mean, Maurice only made 1 million point five, period. That movie died as soon as the gay audience fell off, and most people don't see them because most black people in this country did not support Sounder with Cecily Tyson when it opened. They were at The Godfather. And most gay people in this country do not support lesbian and gay independent films. They're at Batman because they're Americans. And so you have to, at some point, see your life on the screen because you want to, because you care enough to support that kind of work, which is why I'm doing this as a benefit for the Lesbian and Gay Film Festival. You have to seek out and support work which supports your life and gives you a reflection of who we really are. 
And so, and you know, I wish I had I had more time to sort of just li- you know talk a little bit about AIDS and its its lack of reflection uh, on the screen and on television, in spite of the few things that they've done well. But I think the, fa- the you know that that it's it's safe to say that we all like a trip to Disneyland once in a while. You know, it's a lot of fun to go on the rides. But if you try to live there, you're an idiot. You know, and so, and so we're going to close with examples, with three examples from independent films. Uh, first, from my beautiful laundrette, the wonderful scene where the waltz takes place on two sides of a one-way mirror. Uh, a, a clip from Desert Hearts, where Helen Shaver and Patricia Charbonneau are having sort of a political argument about their love affair. And then finally, a scene from Parting Glances, which I think does sort of speak to. AIDS in the sense that this is the scene between Steve Buscemi, the rock musician who has AIDS, and a young 18-year-old gay man who uh, are sort of passing in the night, and I think it's done beautifully because uh, it's about a world that this kid will never know, a gay, a gay world that this kid will never know, and a, a world of the future that Steve Buscemi is never going to know, and how they cross, and it's written beautifully. And then the, the tape will just keep running after those three clips, and there'll be two television commercials, which I think will surprise you quite a lot. <laughs>